Welcome to Abergavenny Baptist Church. Life, faith, together. Bible reading is from John chapter 12 and then verses 1 to 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about half a litre of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone. Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Well, we continue in our series entitled Encounters with Jesus in John's Gospel, and today we look in at Jesus' encounter with Mary, the, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And it's within this encounter that we see what true devotion is, what real worship is. And we read in verse 1, Six days before the Passover, so Jesus is nearing his death. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So it's been a big week for Lazarus. Uh, he was dead. The Bible says he stinketh. He was then raised from the dead. So it's been a big week week for for Lazarus and in verse 2 we read here a dinner was given in Jesus's honor so it's been a week since uh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead uh, Jesus has now returned to Bethany and as he's returned they're gonna get they're gonna give him this huge massive dinner party in the house of Mary Martha and Lazarus to celebrate the fact that he raised Lazarus from the dead this is a, a resurrection party. I've never been to a resurrection party before. I've been to a birthday party, a Christmas party, never been to a resurrection party. I can only imagine it must be one awesome party, a resurrection party. So what we need to learn here is history is a funeral, but it ends in a party when we all are raised from the dead and that party is called heaven. And so they are practicing for that party. Verse 2 continues, Martha what? Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Lazarus doesn't do anything. I wouldn't do anything either. I would be like, I died this week. I'm just going to recline over here by the table. It's been a big week for me. I'm processing a lot. Uh, you know, I died. I, I would get up, but I was dead. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm in recovery mode now. Uh, unlike the, the Lumo video, which we just watched, where everyone is kind of sitting at the table, in those days at a big dinner party, they would recline. They would recline on their left elbow and use their right hand to eat, and they would have their legs and their feet pointing away from the table. And so Lazarus is reclining at the table with Jesus. He's just hanging out with Jesus. He's having fellowship with Jesus. Martha is preparing and serving a meal. Both Lazarus and Martha love Jesus and are expressing their love for Jesus 
but just in different ways. Gary Chapman wrote a book entitled The Five Love Languages, and within this book they look at how people naturally express and receive love in different ways. Some people, like Martha, their primary love language is acts of service. How does Martha love Jesus? She serves. She does something. She's a practical person, and the only way she knows how to express love is to do something, to serve. Some of you are like that. You have to do something. Victoria is, is, is like that. Other people, like Lazarus, their primary love language is quality time. Lazarus loves Jesus and he expresses his love for Jesus by hanging out with Jesus. He just kind of hangs out with Jesus, has fellowship with Jesus and enjoys Jesus' company. I'm like Lazarus. This is my primary love language. Victoria is more like Martha. Hers is acts of service. This caused a lot of tension in our first few years of marriage. I could never understand why she would rather wash the dishes and clean the floor rather than hang out with me and just chat. Uh, uh, until I realized that was her primary love language. That was her way of expressing love for me and the way she would receive love. And she could never understand why I'd always want to just hang out and chat and not do anything. And so... Uh, until she realized that was my primary love language. Mary, her primary love language is giving gifts. As we will later see, she gives Jesus this very expensive gift. So all three love Jesus and are expressing love for Jesus but just in different ways. The, the other love languages, if you're interested, are physical touch and, and words of affirmation. So, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha all love Jesus. And they're all expressing love for Jesus, but they're just expressing it in different ways. But the focus and the emphasis within this passage clearly falls on Mary. Not because her love language is the best. You know, giving gifts is not better than quality time or, or acts of service. No. It, it's not the way she expresses her love. It's not her natural temperament. But it's her passion. She's very passionate. She, she's very passionate, but she's not romantic. And I believe what God is saying to us in this passage and through this passage today is, is that he's calling us to become more passionate in our love and our devotion for Jesus. And so we read in verse 3, Then Mary took about half a liter of pure non, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet, she, and, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. She is very passionate in her love. Firstly, note her extravagant love. When it says she took about half a liter of pure non and expensive perfume, that's equivalent to as Judas points out in verse 5, a year's salary. Uh, this is an average salary for a, 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 for a year for a worker. Um, I, I don't know what the average UK salary is, but a good friend of mine, Google, uh, tells me it's about 30,000 pounds. She gives Jesus a 30,000 pound gift and it's just for that moment. He can't even take the gift away with him. How many of you do not have a friend who gives you 30,000 30, pound birthday gifts? I mean, you don't, do you? I mean, we, I wish I knew that person. That would be amazing, but, but you don't. 
This is extremely extravagant. And this is the passion she has in her love. Oh, just by the way, the, the, the non that the non-perfume would be imported from India. Uh, and so it was extremely expensive. And, and Mary is not rich. Uh, she, she lives in Bethany. Bethany is, means the house of the poor. This is where poor people lived. People who couldn't afford to live in the big city of Jerusalem would live in Bethany. So she's a poor person. Poor people would buy non-oil as an investment. Uh, they would never use the oil. They'll never use the perfume. It was purely for investment purposes. Kind of like sometimes people today may buy gold or, or invest their money and their savings in shares. It's for investment purposes. Or even in some ways, you know, we might put our money in a bank. They wouldn't put their money in the bank. They would take their money, their savings, and they would buy some non perfume because it would hold its value it'd probably increase in value and so it was a great investment this was mary's life savings this was her most precious most expensive possession she had by far and she pours it all out on jesus this is very extravagant this is extremely generous this is passion Also take note of her humble worship. It says she poured it on his feet. In, in that culture, they would anoint someone's head to, to honor them, but she doesn't feel worthy to anoint the head, so she anoints the feet. This is a, an act of great devotion and humility. Now, in, in, in that culture where people would walk around in open sandals and the roads were very dusty and dirty, to touch someone's feet or to wash someone's feet was a disgusting job. It, it was reserved for the lowest of slaves. But Mary doesn't feel worthy to anoint his head, so she anoints his feet. We see Mary three times in the Gospel. Uh, the first time we meet Mary, Jesus is teaching. Where's Mary? At his feet. The second time we meet Jesus, Lazarus has just died. Jesus shows up. Where's Mary? At his feet. The third time we meet Jesus is here. They throw in a dinner party for Jesus. And where's Mary? At the feet of Jesus. Worshiping. She's at the feet of Jesus learning. She's at the feet of Jesus grieving. She's at the feet of Jesus worshiping. Whenever we see Mary, she's at the feet of Jesus. The Greek word that the Bible uses to, for, for worship uh, literally means bow down. Uh, and the implication is you bow down, bow down and kiss the feet. Uh, if an emperor was to come into your presence within that culture, you would bow down, you would humble yourself, and you would kiss their feet. And the Bible uses this word for worship. It's all about submission, it's about surrender, it's about emotion invisible. Invis it's about passion. Thirdly, take note that she wiped his feet with her hair. This is shameless devotion. To let down your hair in that culture was risque. <laughs> I mean, in that Middle Eastern culture, you would only let your hair down in front of your husband. To let your hair down in front of other men well, that was an act of an immoral woman. That was what prostitutes would do. This was really risque. It's, it's kind of, you know, some rabbis even said that uh, if, if a woman let down her hair in front of other men, it was liable for divorce. 
This is kind of like, imagine they've been at a very, very polite dinner party, and all of a sudden a, a lady hitches up her dress up to the top of her thigh to reveal all her leg. This is almost as, as bad as being topless. This is extremely risky. But she loves Jesus with such passion and devotion, she doesn't care what other people think. See, unlike the, the, the Lumo video, when, when she's busy wiping Jesus' feet with her hair, all the disciples are chatting away merrily, no one would have been talking. I mean, there would have been stunned silence. You could feel the tension in the air. The disciples don't know where to look. But she loves Jesus with such passion, such devotion. She doesn't care what other people think. She, she has this unselfconscious love and devotion and passion. She's so in that moment, she doesn't care. Do we have that same shameless and expression, expressive devotion for Jesus? Or are we too self-conscious to express our love for Jesus? Too concerned about what other people would think, so we're not going to mention Jesus. Too much of a British reserve to show any emotion. She's completely unself-conscious and expresses her love for Jesus. That's passion. Do you love Jesus? Are you passionate in your love? You see, she was generous and extravagant in her love. She was humble in her worship. She was shameless and passionate and expressive in her devotion. And she is our model of true Worship and devotion. Verse 4, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wage. So Judas criticizes her passionate devotion. Oh, something I've noticed and experienced is that when you become very passionate in your devotion, people will criticize you. But it won't be the people you expect. It won't be your non-Christian friend. It'll be some respected Christian. It'll be some Christian leader or a Christian mentor or someone you really look up to or a good Christian friend. And it'll come as a complete surprise. You see, we must uh, overcome our predisposition to not liking Judas and hating Judas because we know he betrayed Jesus. At this point, nobody knew that. At this point, he's one of Jesus' respected disciples. Jesus picked 12 guys. He's one of those 12. And in fact, he has a very respected and responsible job within the 12. In verse 6, we discover he's the keeper of the money bag. He, he administers the, their, their, their common fund of finance. He's what you would call their church treasurer. He has a very respected position. And he is the one, this respected disciple of Jesus, who criticizes Mary. It must have been like a pinprick in a balloon for Mary. She's just done this beautiful thing for Jesus. And then she's criticized and now she feels deflated. And he sounds so pious, doesn't he? What about the poor? We could have made 120,000 sandwiches. This is so excessive. He sounds so pious and so godly. Be wary of people who sound very pious when they are being critical of your devotion. And also be aware that the reason they give is really the real reason. The real reason 
Why he's been critical of her devotion is because his heart is in the wrong place and therefore he simply cannot understand or appreciate this extravagant generosity, this passionate devotion. We read in verse 6, he, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was the chief, uh, uh, because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. And, and we discover in, in John chapter 13 and verse 29 that Jesus used to often ask Judas as the church treasurer uh, to give money to the poor. And so he's not just the church treasurer, he's also their food bank manager. Uh, at least so they thought. But actually, he, every time he would go to give money to the poor, he would be pocketing it, it for himself. He was stealing from Jesus' ministry fund for three years, and up until this point, nobody knew. He only pretended to care for other people. He really only cared for himself. His heart was in the wrong place. He loved money. He, he loved money more than he loved Jesus, or the poor for that matter. And because his heart's in the wrong place, he simply cannot appreciate or understand this extravagant, this generous devotion. And so he rebukes her. Verse 7, leave her alone, Jesus replied. When someone has been critical of your passionate devotion, realize that Jesus looks at you and says to your critic, leave her alone. What she did was a beautiful thing. He vindicates her, he stands up for her, he defends her, and he will do the same for you. Verse 7 continues, It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. See, it's not a matter of either loving Jesus or loving the poor. It's both and. We love Jesus and the poor, but this was a unique situation. Jesus is effectively saying this is a one-time opportunity for Mary to anoint my body for burial. Somehow Mary had perceived that Jesus was not only going to be killed soon, but he was probably going to be killed and buried in such haste that there wouldn't be time to anoint his body. And so she's so overwhelmed with love and, 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 and passion that she's led to this very extravagant anointing of his body. And so she does a very beautiful thing. But take note of her motivation. She had sensed that Jesus was going to die. And that somehow he was going to die for her. And this overwhelmed her. I don't understand how... Lord, I don't, I don't know it, why exactly, but I, I realize you are doing this for me. You are dying for me. And it overwhelms me. Sometimes people try to, to have this sort of passionate devotion because they think if they have this passionate devotion, then, then God will bless them. God will answer their prayers. Other people will try and have this passionate devotion because they're on a, on a guilt trip and they're trying to convince God and, and convince themselves that they are actually a good person, a godly person. Other people will try to have this passionate devotion because they're trying to impress other people, to show other people how spiritual they are, how holy they are. If that's your motivation, it will never last. It will never sustain You'll end up being burnt out or you'll be let down, but it'll never last and it'll never work. It's only when we realize that God loves us so much that he died for us, that he died for me, 
And, and when we start receiving that love, when we start becoming overwhelmed by that love, will it lead to a passionate devotion that will last? It's only when we understand that, that, and receive this, this love, this amazing love of God, that our hearts will be able to sing, as we will in a moment, were the whole realm of nature mine. That were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. See, ultimately, God doesn't want your things. He doesn't want your gifts. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your love. He wants your passionate, generous, extravagant love and devotion. Do you love God passionately? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so challenged by Mary's extravagant, passionate love. Father, we confess that so often we allow our British reserve to, to control us and, and we suppress emotions and, or, or we're just too afraid of what other people might think. That we simply don't get lost in wonder and awe of you. Father, we pray that you would reveal your love to us afresh. That you would pour it into us. As we approach Easter, Father, let that, that become a, re a reality in our life. That you love us. Your amazing love. That it demands our all, our soul, our life, our all. And Father, by your Holy Spirit, give us that freedom that Mary had to passionately, extravagantly, generously love you with everything we've got. Amen. Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit our website, abgavenibaptist.co.uk.